Today, I'm gonna to show you how to make mead on a budget because we're gonna make the cheapest mead we can in 2023. Let's get started. So if you're a fan of my channel, you know, or you've seen the video of me doing this a couple years ago. I have already done this before and we're gonna do it again not necessarily to make it uh, better or cheaper, but I think I can just walk you through the process better. That mead, the gallon of mead we made at that point was about 12 US dollars for a gallon. This one is gonna be about 12 US dollars for the gallon itself as well, which is a pretty good deal. Why is mead so expensive to make comparative to beer or wine or other things? It's mostly this guy right here, honey. Honey is expensive. If you are lucky, you will find a You'll find a vendor that will sell you honey for maybe $3 per pound, but generally speaking, you're gonna find most honey is three to like $12 per pound. And mead uses a lot of honey, especially higher alcoholic or higher alcohol mead. So let's first talk about the base ingredients we're gonna use today. We are gonna use this Sam's honey, which cost me about a little less than $10 for three pounds. We are using tap water, which is free to me. Not really free, I pay for it, but it's cheaper. And this Safel US05 packet. I believe this yeast is about a dollar or two. I'm gonna go ahead and say the water is free, even though it's not really free. This honey being a little less than $10, this is about a $12 mead. We're gonna end up using all of the honey, so we'll have a sweet mead by the end, and we'll talk about that. So those are our base ingredients. Here's a recipe card with a couple steps here to walk you through. So we have our base recipe. Now let's talk about a little bit of equipment. There's a very beginner basic way to do this with no equipment at all. And that would be using a you know plastic apple juice, gallon of apple juice or something like that. You could empty out the apple juice or a gallon jug of water and just use that base water for your fermenter. You don't necessarily have to have things to move the mead into new containers. And what I mean by that is when you're moving, you know, from a, a plastic fermenter to something else, you could pour it. It's not recommended. We'll talk about that more in a second. And you don't really need stuff to stir or anything like that because you can shake a, a carboy or you can shake a plastic jug. Now there is a next step up. If you want to do this more often, it's a good investment and I would recommend for best mead making practice to have some glass carboys, which is a one gallon glass carboy, to have something like a hydrometer, which is a way we're gonna be able to measure our alcohol. We'll talk about that in a second. A tube for floating our hydrometer. We are also gonna use a turkey baster here in a little bit. Star sand, which is a sanitizing solution. Again, we'll talk about it here in a second. There's a thing called an auto siphon and tubing, which helps you move the liquid out. And then of course there's bottles and there's caps and corks and all that. Those are extra things you don't necessarily have to have, but they will help you make a better brew, honestly, and uh, be more efficient with your brewing. So today I'm using some of that nice equipment. I'm not using the plastic jug or anything like that. I'm using a glass carboy and a hydrometer and all those things. So let's go ahead and start by first taking and sanitizing our equipment. We're gonna sanitize this glass carboy. We're gonna use our star sand. So let's go over to the sink. Okay, we're at our sink. We've got our carboy here. Let's get a little water in it. Now I'm actually gonna save some of this water I'm creating here in a second. I am going to get a little bit more water in here. So I filled this up with water and I really just need a small amount of star sand. So I'm literally just gonna dump just a tiny amount probably more than what I need. And I'm just gonna shake it up a little bit. All right, so we've dumped our star sand water. You see there's foam in here. The nice thing about star sand, it is okay to use this foam. Their, their whole slogan is don't fear the foam. So while I'm gonna dump out most of the water here, the foam is not scary. All right, we have a clean container ready to go. I actually kind of pre-make my star sand often, so this whole bucket right here is all star sand, star sand water. So I'm gonna go ahead and put my hydrometer and this other stuff in here that is going to be used here in a little bit. All right, so here we go. I am going to do a couple of things. First of all, I need to get a scale. So this is also not included in your equipment, but it's helpful. I have a scale right here that will help me. I am going to weigh out, I'm gonna tear out my scale. 
I'm only using for the start of this mead about two and a half pounds of this honey. The last half pound is gonna be used to back sweeten with later on. So we'll talk about that later. So our scale's ready to go. I'm gonna carefully do this. You can use a funnel or something like that. I've done a lot of honey pouring in my time. So I'm gonna go ahead and put two and a half pounds into here. Again, you can use a funnel if you feel more comfortable doing this with a funnel. Uh, I have done this quite a bit. And while it is kind of messy at the beginning, beginning you can always practice. All right, we have hit our mark. We have ourselves two and a half pounds of honey in here. We're now gonna go ahead and add our water. And our water is gonna go pretty high up. We're gonna make ourselves go kind of to the bottom of this handle specifically. If you're doing this in a plastic jug or something else, you generally wanna leave a little room for fermentation. So leave about an inch to two inches because there will be bubbling and you don't wanna deal with any problems with that. And to spare our yeast, we're not gonna use super hot water. We're gonna use kind of warm water, but we're gonna stay more on the cool side. All right, next up, we have our water. Again, leaving some room. Um, I wanna give you a little pro tip here. If you're doing this and you want to ensure that when you move your mead into a new container, let's say a gallon in this case, that you have plenty of mead, you can start with more mead in the first place. If I'm starting my recipe and I want to make sure that when I move it, I have that gallon, I'm going to take and use a bigger vessel. This is a two gallon bucket. So what I would do is I would start my mead at like 1.2 gallons, a little bit above that marker, because when you move it into a new container, there's a layer of sediment, you don't wanna get that. So you often will lose mead. So pro tip, start with more mead than you need. That way you have less headspace in that secondary, which we'll get that to that in a second. So I'm now gonna take a bung, which this one is a, has a hole in it for a, an airlock. I'm gonna go ahead and put this on top. Now I don't love doing this. In fact, I have a, a bung that's closed. If you have this, you can you know shake with this easier. Instead, I'm just gonna take and cover this hole and shake. One hour later. Okay. A lot of shaking later. Arms hurt. This is mixed up. At this point, we call this the must. Must is your honey and water mixture. It's kind of slang we use in the mead world, the slang term at least. So we have our mixture here. We have our yeast. We're gonna talk about that in a moment. Before we add our yeast, I wanna go ahead and take a gravity reading. This is where your hydrometer comes in handy. The only way to know how alcoholic your brew is gonna be is if you can read a gravity number or a starting gravity. There's another method called bricks, but that's, that's way more advanced. I'm gonna go ahead and just start you with starting gravity or original gravity, making sure I'm using clean stuff. I'm gonna go ahead and get a small sample and put it into this tube. Again, without a hydrometer, you're not ever gonna know how alcoholic your brew is. So I highly recommend to do it. To get one, they're pretty cheap. We are gonna take and float our hydrometer into this liquid. And let me show you what it looks like up close. Specific gravity is measured by how much sugar content is here. So you can see based off of this, if you look real close, it's kind of hard to see through the camera, but this is floating at 1.084 starting gravity. With this number and this knowledge, we are going to take, and remember it first of all, we're also gonna put our stuff away. So we have a starting gravity of 1.084. You can also call it original gravity. We're gonna pour this back in, because we're going to, should. Again, still remembering that number. In a moment, we'll write it down on the side. That's our starting measurement. In a little bit, after this is fermented, that number is gonna change, and it will probably be 1.000, because generally speaking, yeast consume all the sugar they can, and this is not high enough of a starting gravity to cap out our yeast we're gonna use. We'll talk about more of that in a second. One reason I like the Sapel US05 is because you get a lot of it. This is a 10 gram, excuse me, 11.5 gram packet of yeast. We only need for this recipe about one and a half grams. So we're only using about an eighth of this in total, which is really nice. I have a whole bucket of other yeast I could use. There are hundreds of yeasts out there and I'm gonna push you to a video I did for traditional mead and yeasts has all the information you need to know about how to choose your yeast. But 
Picking your yeast is very important. While you might go to the store and get yourself some bread yeast, it's not recommended to make the best brew. You're gonna have a better time with a, a brewing specific yeast. There are lots of ways to treat your yeast in this circumstance. So some people will, will rehydrate their yeast. If you look on the back of this, a lot of the time it will say to rehydrate your dry yeast before you pitch them. In my experience, I've had mixed results. But for the most part, I have not seen a huge change whenever I have rehydrated my yeast. So in this circumstance, I am going to take and weigh out a small amount of yeast. All right, I've got my little scale here. I'm gonna go for one and a half grams, which isn't much. Oh, I went a little over, 1.59. That little extra yeast is not gonna hurt us. That's okay. So we have a very small amount of yeast or dry yeast. I'm gonna put this just to the side right now. We're gonna save that packet. And what we're gonna do with our packet there is just put it into a plastic baggie essentially and put it in our fridge and it will save for quite some time. We can use it for more brews. So we're gonna add our yeast straight on top. Give it a little, little shake, help them get all mixed in. So at this point, these yeast are gonna to start to wake up and they're waking up in a lot of sugar. And so that is where the rehydration factor comes in. It's the difference between waking up and then taking a five minute break and then drinking your coffee and you know, waking up in the exact second you wake up, somebody's pouring coffee in your mouth. You're gonna, you know, more than likely, you're gonna have a better time with a little bit of uh, leeway or, or warm up into your coffee. However, they'll be okay in this circumstance. I've experienced this before. So now we're ready to start fermenting, to let this thing start fermenting. So we're gonna take our bung that has the hole in it, we're gonna put this on top, and then we're also gonna take an airlock. This is a three-piece airlock, because it's in three pieces. I put some water in here. Now you could put some spirit, you could put vodka, you could put tequila, you could put something like that that's higher proof that will evaporate less. I'm using water in this circumstance because I, I believe that I'm not gonna have much evaporation. I also check my airlocks regularly. If you don't check your airlocks, make sure you are using a tequila or a spirit of sorts that will not evaporate as quick. We're gonna put this airlock on top and then I'm gonna write down on the side all of my information. So I always start with what this is. This is a traditional. I put OG for original gravity. This was 1.084 as we remember. I put P for primary because we're entering primary fermentation, which is where the bulk of fermentation happens. So I put my date and that's it. Now, before we walk away and we get to the next steps, I have my stuff here. I wanna talk about yeast nutrition for a second. These yeast can ferment and do pretty well. However, they're gonna do even better if we feed them along the way. So the way you feed your yeast is to give them proper micronutrients and macronutrients and just kind of like how we need food to get through the day. Same thing for them. We're gonna use some specifically Fermade O. This is an organic yeast nutrient. Now I'm using a calculator to figure out how much yeast nutrient I need. I take my starting gravity number or original gravity number, I put it in there, with the amount of mead I'm making and it will tell me how much of this Fermate O to add. Now there's other yeast nutrients out there. You might go to the local brew shop or online and find something that just says yeast nutrient. There's something called DAP or dimonium phosphate. There is Fermate K. There is uh, something called yeast holes. There's lots of options. And there are different, you know, as you plug your calculator in, you have some different realms there. The only one I wanna caution you with is dimonium phosphate. That one is a straight, nitrogen source. Yeast need nitrogen, honey is low in nitrogen. So that is a great way to give them nitrogen. However, after 9% alcohol by volume or ABV, they don't really metabolize it and you can sometimes get some weird flavors. So a more organic way to do it is Fermate O. You can buy it in a big, uh, basically pack this way. I recommend this for a better mead. You can try and ferment without nutrients, but I guarantee you're gonna have a tough time because yeast when they get stressed, they put off off flavors. Just like that Snickers commercial, you know, when you're, you're not yourself when you're hungry, yeast are kind of not themselves when they're hungry. They get a little uh, persnickety and they put off fusels and stressors and stuff like that. So feeding your yeast is very helpful. I recommend Fermato 
A lot of these uh, equipment pieces and things like this will be down in the description if you would like to purchase them uh, through Amazon, some Amazon links. Alongside knowing our yeast is quality, we wanna know the actual temperature range that this can ferment in, which the temperature range for this one is 59 to 71 degrees Fahrenheit for this. So the great news is my house sets at about 68, 69, 70. So we're gonna be at the top of that range, but that's okay. We wanna put this in a dark place. You don't necessarily have to ferment in the dark. There's not a huge change, but I think it can help the yeast. We're gonna put it away and we're gonna watch it, and I'll show you what the fermentation looks like. Here we are about 24 hours later. This is fermenting, actively fermenting right now. I'm gonna show you a up close of what fermentation looks like. And then we're gonna talk about adding our nutrients and all of that that I kind of mentioned. So here's what it looks like up close. Okay, so I am super zoomed in here, but you can see as I get real close to this, there are some bubbles coming up. This is showing fermentation. Now, depending on how vigorous your fermentation is, you might see a lot of bubbling really fast or something slow like this. Essentially, this is showing, hey, there is fermentation occurring. All of the yeast are at the bottom or mixed in and they are, they're pushing up that CO2. Those bubbles are the byproduct of the yeast as they consume sugar and the oxygen that was there, they are putting out CO2, which is why we're bubbling here. If you have fruit, this is important. Make sure you leave space for that fruit to expand. That fruit will expand above the carboy, will continue to go up and it can get stuck in the neck here. When that fruit gets stuck in the neck of this carboy, it can come out of the airlock and that's a big mess. Another way we know this is fermenting is by our airlock activity. You'll notice that this will bubble. Now this is not a total indicator of all fermentation because over time, this will slow down. Just because your bubbling stops does not mean that the whole thing is done fermenting. Okay, so now that we've looked at fermentation, we see what it's like. Let's go ahead and talk about adding our nutrients. At this point, between the 24 and 48 hour mark, you can choose to go ahead and start adding more nutrients. There's a couple steps or ways you can add nutrients. We could have added them all in the very beginning. However, there's some cautionary things that come with that. And I'll throw them on screen. I can kind of explain, if you use dimonium phosphate, do not just start off with dimonium phosphate right as you pitch your yeast because they don't react well to it, honestly. You can also front load, which is what that is, with your Fermade O, which is that organic yeast nutrient or your yeast holes. It's not a bad thing. We are safe with this 24 hour mark to go ahead now and add our dimonium phosphate. If we had that, um, our Fermade O, which is what we're using, our Fermade K, anything like that. We're gonna be a little bit lazy here and we're gonna add all of our nutrients at this point. There's a alternative way to do it called step feeding, where you take the total nutrient need and then you break it into four parts and you add them at different days. So day zero, the starting point, you would add a fourth of your nutrient and then day two and then day four and then six. We're gonna be lazy and put all of it at this point right here. Based off of our calculator that we threw everything into, we are gonna add 3.6 grams of Fermade O specifically. Now again, we're using this one, use the calculator for your other ones. There's lots of ways to do this and there's a more safe way and a less safe way when it comes to making a mess. I'm gonna show you the safe way first and then talk about the not so safe way. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go ahead and measure out 3.6 grams of Fermade O into this little glass, just so I have my total amount. All right, so I have my 3.6 grams of Fermade O, which is right here, very small amount, honestly. I'm gonna take a little portion of this mead, and instead of putting it right into this container, which I'll talk about why I don't wanna do that here in a second, I am gonna actually take a little bit of it out and put it into here. At this point, we don't really care too much about oxygen getting into this brew, because it's still pretty early on. The yeast can still consume it and use it. So now I'm gonna get another up close and show you why you don't wanna just dump this stuff into your big carboy. All right, we have our stuff right here. This is, becomes a little bit of a science experiment. Watch me dump this into here and shake it up just a little bit. You'll notice there is a fair amount of foam being produced from this. That is because the yeast get really excited, start to put off a lot of CO2. There's degassing happening here because there's CO2 trapped in this. So essentially what we're doing is we're expediting the degassing process, getting the yeast really excited so they foam up and cause this crazy mess. 
That right there happens in your big carboy. When you're doing this in a smaller vessel with less room, less headspace, sometimes that means it foams out and makes a huge mess. If you're fermenting in a big bucket or something, you're not gonna see a big problem with this. But because we're using this glass carboy, or if you used a plastic fermenter or something like that, you might see that. Now we have the fun part of just adding this back in and it will start to foam up a little bit, but we're gonna go slow. See what I mean? We're gonna go real slow. So we have less of a problem with this. We're also making a mess on the side here. Again, we're trying not to make a big mess, but we're still having a little bit of a problem. See, even now, because we, we did this, we've caused a lot of foam. So we're gonna have to wait a second and come back and finish filling this up. It's been like four or five minutes and we're still at this point. Again, that's a lot of foaming, but I think we're okay to try this. Just a little bit more. All right, we have finished adding our mead back in. That's gonna go ahead and mix in pretty naturally. Um, we're gonna go ahead now and stick this airlock back on. One way you can help that foaming problem is to degas this. And that process includes taking and you can open up this container and you can kind of stir around in there and you'll see some of that CO2 leave this. You can also take and swirl it some if you want to swirl that carboy. Um, any way you want to just kind of lightly shake up the carboy or the bucket if you're fermenting in that. Don't go crazy though. Don't like start shaking this carboy and stuff because you'll have a lot of foaming in a big mess. We're now ready just to let this set again. We can set back for another probably a week without doing anything. We're gonna put this back in our dark location and let it keep fermenting. So let's let this thing keep on going. Okay, we are 18 days into fermentation and you can see, if you look real close, there's some bubbling still occurring and that could be two things. It could be fermentation or it could be degassing. Now there's one way we can find out. We'll talk about that in a second, but I have a feeling this is probably almost done fermenting. Let's look at the bottom of this carboy real fast. All right, you can see at the bottom of this carboy, there's some sediment. This is normally yeast or any particles or stuff that are settling at the bottom. As the CO2 is mixing everything up and, and keeping things in suspension, the sediment is less apparent. However, as it starts to off gas or have less CO2 action, you'll see more of this sediment. So one surefire way to see where this is at fermentation wise is to take a gravity reading. Here we have our gravity reading 18 days in. One thing I'm noting is that it is probably not done. This is at 1.038 gravity, which means we still have some fermentation to go through. So this thing is fermenting. It's just fermenting slowly. There is some of that sediment at the bottom, but clearly this is not quite done. So we're gonna put it away and let it continue to ferment. And our hope is to get this down to 1.000 gravity. All right, we are back. It's been about 30 days since the start of fermentation. I've gone ahead and got another sample. This time, our hydrometer, you know, close up, is reading 1.000 level, meaning that it is done fermenting through every bit of sugar that we have here. So with this starting at 1.084 and now being at 1.000, we can plug that into a calculator, a specifically a specific gravity calculator to find our ABV. We can also use this formula on screen if you prefer to do that. We're looking at somewhere in the realm of a 10.8 or 9% by my rough math in my head right now. So that's not a bad high ABV brew. Our next step with this having gone through all fermentation, we've let it sit for a little bit and sort of start to clear. It's not fully clear, obviously, but there's the sediment here at the bottom, which is the dead yeast and stuff that's settled. We can let this continue to set and maybe find some more um, sediment over time and see it clear up. However, we're gonna move on to the racking stage. In your timeline of your mead, it might take more than 30 days, depending on how quick the fermentation goes. So I would say your fermentation time for a mead of this strength will be somewhere between, let's say three and six weeks is like a rough estimate of when you should see the fermentation start and end. Let's move this into a new container. I'm gonna use a couple things. First of all, I've got another 
vessel here that I'm gonna move this into. I've already sanitized this. I've got some auto siphon. I've got an auto siphon and tubing. This is the auto siphon. It's basically just a kind of hand pump in a way. We're gonna put this in here. We've got some tubing. This is gonna connect, of course, to the auto siphon and help us move the brew into this container without there being any extra uh, oxygen added, essentially. I will have a link to equipment below if you need to buy any of this equipment for your brewing. I also want to move from a higher surface to a lower surface. So I'm flipping over this bucket right here. We're gonna raise this up to here in a moment. Don't worry, we'll do a tasting of this and I'll tell you what it tastes like. But we're gonna go ahead and move this from this vessel into this one. So I'm going high surface, low surface, auto siphon. You don't have to have an auto siphon necessarily, but I will say it makes life way easier you're also gonna be less likely to introduce oxygen and oxygen and alcohol is not great. So you wanna watch out for that. Once this starts flowing, I can just go ahead and put my auto siphon in there. I'm kinda at an angle to avoid as much of the sediment as possible. We're just gonna let this move over into this new container. While we do that, let's get a taste of our current dry mead. All right. So you have also have a choice. If you want to put this back into there, you can. Oftentimes I'll end up just dumping this back into my, my brew. I know some people don't like to do that and that's okay. What's this taste like? About 30 days in. Honey is very prominent. The floral side is very prominent. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, very, um, I get a, a honey bear kind of honey side with this but it's pretty smooth actually, surprisingly. It does have a little bit of a young mead characteristic in that it is a little bit yeasty, meaning the yeast character is still kind of in there. Even though it's theoretically at the bottom, it could still be floating around. That will kind of age out. The alcohol content burn is definitely there. And that will also start to mellow over time. It's really not a bad base. It does need time to age being about 11%, this thing at 30 days is not going to taste very smooth. It's not gonna taste, not necessarily bad, but it could be way better, of course. So, now we've tasted it. We're going to take and rotate to this to the side so we can try and get as much meat as possible out of this brew. And this is also gonna help us get any, or keep all of that sediment at the bottom. We're trying to move this lightly because obviously there is uh, motion happening here and um, we don't wanna get any of that yeast at the bottom. I'm also, because we're, we're on an equal plane, we're going really slow. If I were to raise this up, the gravity would help it flow faster, but I'm not too worried about that right now. All right, getting about as much as we can and done. Not bad, it's a fair amount of mead. We obviously have some headspace. I have some oxygen on top over here. This is not truly ideal, honestly. Um, we're, we're gonna have some issues with oxygen on top. So I won't leave this with oxygen for a long time. Our next steps are actually pretty quick uh, in the grand scheme of things. We're now going to take, with this having moved out of primary fermentation, I don't want this to be any uh, more dry. I also don't want it to ferment anymore if I add more honey. So we're gonna have to stabilize this thing. So stabilizing is a way of halting any further fermentation. And we, in this circumstance, want to add sweetness without the yeast being able to consume the honey that we're gonna add. Any new sugar added to this that is fermentable by the yeast will be consumed and the yeast will just kick back up and basically start fermenting again. Stabilizing halts that fermentation possibility. There are a couple ways to stabilize a brew and there's, I'll tell you about them right now. There's a method that uses potassium metabisulfite and potassium sorbate. They are two chemicals in conjunction used to stabilize and uh, further prevent any fermentation. The metabisulfite draws out any oxygen, which is half of the problem there. And the second one, sorbate, actually makes the yeast go dormant. At that point when they go dormant, they, they can't reproduce, they can't continue to consume the sugars that we're gonna add. So that's option one. Option two, you can pasteurize a brew, which I'll give you some pasteurization schedules here and how, how to do it. It's essentially where you heat up the brew 
to a certain degree for a certain amount of time, and that will also kill off the yeast and keep them from fermenting any further. Those are the two main ones. There are other methods of like waiting a really, really long time and racking off of any uh, yeast and things like that, but more than likely what you'll find is the uh, fermentation will kick up with even a small amount of yeast. So I would use one of the top two methods to be able to do that. We are going to use potassium metabisulfite and potassium sorbate to stabilize this brew. I've got myself a big container of sorbate right here. You might have something smaller. And this is, these are Camden tablets, which are the same as potassium metabisulfite. I'm gonna use one Camden tablet, which is roughly about this many grams of potassium metabisulfite, and one half teaspoon of the sorbate. So I'm actually gonna crush up this Camden tablet real fast so that it will mix in easier. Okay, and then here's my sorbate, half a teaspoon. All right, this has been stabilized, or now it's started the stabilization process. It'll take about 24 hours for the yeast to take all of those things and truly start to lie dormant and not be able to ferment on any sugars left. We're now gonna walk away and come back in 24 hours and think about back sweetening this thing. If you would like to pasteurize, of course, the pasteurization is more immediate I would say once you pasteurize that brew and you heat it up to that temp, they kind of die on the spot. It doesn't take 24 hours. Either way, make sure you stabilize your brew. If you do not, your yeast will re-ferment with new sugars, assuming you add them, and then they will re-ferment in this bottle, or if you were to bottle them in smaller bottles, you would find yourself with some explosive mead to handle, and that's not fun. Let's come back in 24 hours and consider back sweetening this thing. All right, everything we've added to stabilize this has been in for about 24 or 48 hours, enough time to really mix in. We're ready to back sweeten. I've got the rest of my honey from before. So I went ahead and I put this in some hot water, put the container in hot water so it would hopefully get a little bit, be easier to pour, I guess. I'm gonna weigh this first, actually do this. I'm just gonna weigh this out and as I add my honey, I'm probably gonna add the rest of like what's here. So. We're back sweetening to our preferred sweetness level. Now, I am gonna go ahead and say that I'm probably gonna need at least six ounces of honey to get this to a sweetness level that will be uh, most desirable. However, if you want something sweeter, you can go even more sweet, add more honey. Essentially, you're adding honey until you taste it to the level you want or taste it at the sweetness level you want. I've also got something to stir, Sta sanitized, of course. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and start adding stuff. So I'm gonna go ahead and pour some honey in. That was about, I'm really close to my six ounces, like I said. Six ounces of honey will roughly bring this up, I wanna say 10-ish gravity points, which is a decent amount, or not a decent, it's okay amount of sweetness. It's not gonna be super sweet, but it's gonna give a little bit of character back to it. So now we just lightly stir. Again, we're lightly stirring. You're not gonna go vigorous like your first time you mixed up your honey and water because we want to avoid as much oxygen introduction as possible. Of course, we need a taste of it real fast to see where it's at, of course. Just a little bit. Okay. That is, adds just enough sweetness to really, again, highlight honey character, but not go too far to where it's just cloyingly sweet. I'm gonna go ahead and say that's a good level. I don't want to go too crazy sweet. I do have some honey left over, so I could theoretically use this. In total, we've used a little less than three pounds of honey for this brew. Now, one thing we can do to see truly how sweet it is, we can take another gravity reading, which means we're gonna put our hydrometer back in the tube, float this liquid in, and we're gonna see how much sugar we actually added. Now that we've added that honey in, here's our current gravity, or final gravity, it's about 1.010, which means that we've back sweetened just enough to get up to that level. So like I just said, that's enough sugar to bring out that honey character, but we're not super cloyingly sweet. I'm also roughly, <laughs> I said 10, 10 earlier, and I was correct, so that's fun. Now, rather than pour this back in, I'm actually just gonna drink this mead, because we get to, you'll notice that this is not very clear. So you might be asking yourself, what do I do now? This is not a clear mead, you might care about this, you might not care at all. If you don't care, this next step is very easy. Essentially, you put your airlock back on 
walk away for at least 24, 48 more hours, make sure you see no more fermentation, no more bubbling, reactivating of yeast, and then we'll bottle it, which we'll talk about here in a second. If you want the mead to be clear, you gotta maybe try some things. One of those things is time. You can just let this thing age for who knows how long. It could be six months, it could be eight months, it could be a year before all of these things clear out to the bottom. It's not a bad idea, it just takes time. You could also start to use some clearing agents. So here's a whole list of them. Some of them have different elements to them. Stuff like Kisasol and Chitosan uh, is a shellfish based thing. So if you are allergic to shellfish, obviously that's not the way to go. There are other ones that are different that work in the same manner. The one I'm gonna use today, again, you don't have to do this, is Sparkaloid. Sparkaloid is another one of these agents that helps to take all the particulates and clump them together and bring them down to the bottom. This says for one tablespoon for uh, six gallons. So obviously we are gonna bring that down. So we need one half teaspoon for this one gallon of mead. So this is a quarter teaspoon little thing. Here's one quarter, the other quarter. Now we don't just dump that in. We need actually need to get a little bit of water and we're gonna put it in here and then we're gonna heat this up. I'm actually just gonna throw it in the microwave and it's gonna boil and then we'll add that in. So give me one second. All right, so this got a little sketchy there in there. But now I gotta dump this in. Oh, I got it everywhere. Probably a little more water than what I needed. Now, before the people go, well, you've diluted the mead. Yeah, a little bit, honestly. The other uh, alternatives will use less water in that circumstance, but that's okay. We've maybe diluted by like a quarter percent. So you'll see here, I made a mess here, but I'm gonna shake that up a little bit. This is gonna look pretty unclear, but we're gonna let this set for a few days. We're gonna come back. After the few days, it will, stuff will be at the bottom, including, well, the honey's mixed in, so you're, don't worry, you're not losing the honey you added. You're just taking all the particulates and stuff that are floating there, going to the bottom. It has been roughly about five or six days since we added our sparkaloid. Now you can see it's kind of cleared up. There's some haze here. This theoretically might continue to clear up. However, I'm gonna go ahead and bottle it. I do think it could be crystal clear. Give it another two weeks, three weeks, who knows? But we're gonna go ahead and bottle it. Now the process of bottling is pretty simple. You could theoretically just go ahead and like try and pour into bottles, but I don't, I don't love that option because it adds oxygen. And oxygen and, and alcohol are not your friends, <laughs> or not friends, I should say. So we're gonna use an auto siphon. This is an auto siphon, which of course, if you need one, there's a link below in the description to get one. And we're gonna need some tubing and a bottling wand. We're gonna connect all three of these. They have been sanitized. I went ahead and sanitized them with my rinsing sanitizer. So we're gonna connect auto siphon to this tubing and then the bottling wand to that. Now I also need, because we're gonna use gravity here to help us out a little bit, I'm going to slightly move this over so I can use this upside down pot as a higher surface. You can use anything, of course, to get a higher surface, but there's a lot of gunk there at the bottom. You can kind of see. We don't want that in our brew, so we're gonna go ahead and pull this airlock off. And my bottles have also been sanitized. I should be clear on that. We're gonna bottle into some, well, a swing top, a crown cap or bottle cap, and some actual wine cork bottles. If you want the easy route, the swing top's nice because you don't need any equipment. You literally just put the cap on top of it, which we'll talk about. Otherwise, you need a cork pusher or corker, which you put the cork into, we'll talk about in a second, or a bottle capper. And this is a hand bottle capper and hand uh, bottle corker. But first, let's go ahead and rack, we'll bottle this thing into here. This is kind of the, the tough part. The first one's always a little bit tough. We're going to set our siphon in here and we're gonna have to do one hand, this is the hard part, one handed little racking. Now, we, again, we wanna avoid this bottom layer as, much, as best as possible. So what I'm gonna do is get this flowing, which right now it's flowing out of this vessel. And we're gonna go ahead and let it fill up each bottle. This process takes a few minutes, that's okay. You can do this in any size bottle, by the way. 
no matter what size you have, it works as long as it can seal in some way. So you can see these, this one's not as clear as the other. We're probably going to cap out after this one, even though I could, I could go for another bottle. So let gravity help me here. All right. So again, you might say I'm being wasteful and you're right. There's a little bit of me down there I could save. Um, I'm not going to in this circumstance. That's all stuff that we don't really want. It's kind of murky and gross. All right. So we've cleared everything. Let's take care of the easy one. This is the swing top, literally just swing and then done. These will only keep, swing tops will keep for quite some time, but like super long storage is not great. Let's go over to bottle caps. So one way to bottle cap is a bottle capper. You can use a hand one. They also make a bench one if you do a lot, which for a lot of things, I personally use the bench one more often, but this one you just put the cap on top, put the piece and then press down. And voila, we have a capped mead. And the last one, again, there's an alternative. If you want a corker, that's not as annoying, honestly. If you do a lot of corking, you can buy a floor corker, which I'll show you a picture of. I have one, it's really nice. If not, you can use a hand corker. It looks like this with, well, here's looks like this. You put the cork into here and then you take and put this on top. It grips the sides and you push down. This bottle's tall. Much easier on a lower surface. So that put a little bit of a weird cork on top. All right, at this point, we've got all of our bottles. We could put a label on them, but we're not going to. The speed is a couple months old at this point. I got it, I don't remember exactly how much. So I'm gonna come back here in a minute. Well, a minute, a little bit, <laughs> I guess. Let it age for a while longer, and maybe we'll see some clarity differences, maybe not. You know, time can be fickle. And we'll come back for a tasting, so I'll be right back. All right, and here we are for the finale, for the tasting. You've been through this entire video and you've probably been very patient. And I hope you, you've uh, learned something through this process. So let's taste this mead. Again, this is our cheapest mead possible. It's also a traditional mead. We're not including any fruit or any element like that. That would up the cost of it inevitably. We are gonna go ahead and open up the swing top and leave the corked and the capped versions alone. So, Luckily there's no hiss or anything. We are drinking this at the four month mark. You can absolutely take and let yours age for as long as you want. Four months is really not bad for this uh, level of ABV. It should be pretty smooth and nice, hopefully. You can see that this one's, it's not super clear. I mean, it's got a little bit of haze and it was probably cause <laughs> I bottled this from the middle portion there. Anyways. The clarity is not the end of the world. It's the taste that we want. I mean, it smells super honey. Like it's got that, um, I would say a nondescript flower, floral aroma, because this is more of like a, I think it's a wildflower if I remember. It does have a little bit of like minty brightness in there, which is interesting. Here we go. <laughs> Okay, so alcohol presence is like really low. You don't get a lot of ABV or that burn, which is a good thing. The honey is really nice. I really like how bright, um, but not, I mean, this is not too sweet. We ended at that 10, 1.010 final gravity, which is just enough sweetness to highlight the honey character while not being super duper duper sweet. At four months, this thing is really good. And for a cheap $12, I've got, what I got, five bottles of mead, some of them being wine bottles. That's pretty dang good. This is a great mead. Obviously, I mentioned um, the fact that if we added fruit or other elements in here, you'd up the cost. If you want to make fruited meads, you can definitely do that. Now, again, cost will go up um, based on what you're using. If you'd like to know when to add your fruits into your mead, one way you can do this is look up whatever fruit mead recipe you're looking for on YouTube. And you'll probably find a video by myself or my buddy doing the most um, or Faywood Mead. These are some channels that I highly recommend. 
that you stumble across because they've got some great recipes. We've done a lot of stuff and the recipes are tested. The same thing can be said for spices. If you wanted to add nutmeg, clove, cinnamon, uh, any spice like that. You can also add oak to your meads to make them more interesting and more complex. Add that sort of character there. So there are lots of options for you. You don't necessarily have to stick to the traditional mead category. We just stayed here this time because we wanted to keep this cheaper. Is there a way to do this cheaper? Absolutely. If you have your own bees, you could make mead for theoretically like $2 a gallon or something like that. However, I don't have my own bees. So I'm stuck to buying the cheapest honey I can find in that circumstance. However, I will mention this. There's a noticeable difference between this right here and higher quality honey. The higher quality honey you have, the better your mead is gonna taste. So I encourage you to invest in nice honey. Again, it's money, so I get it. You're probably watching this wanting to make a cheap mead and that's okay. Thank you for watching this video. This has been a slow crawl through the process and I know it's been a long one, but I hope that you've seen every step of the way. And if you're a beginner, welcome. Come on, make some mead. And if you wanna learn more about it, I have a ton of videos all about mead making and I probably an can answer your question with a video I've made if you have one. Check out the links in the description for all the equipment and things like that. Those are affiliate links. The affiliate link just means that if you purchase through that link, I get a small percentage of whatever your purchase is with no extra cost to you. So feel free to use those if you'd like. Go make some mead, ask some questions below, and I hope to see you in another video. Cheers. Thank you.